Greetings, most gracious audience. I am Sir Persevere, Knight of the Hand-Drawn Realm. Even before I aligned myself with the fandom menace, I noticed things were wrong with the animation world. Disney had stopped making its beautiful hand animation, Pixar copycat CGI had become all the rage, and what little hand animation that remained had been reduced to Adventure Time scribbled crap. Long have I sought for the kind of animation that entertainment companies used to make. I hope one day we can all make classic animation great again. Of course, I officially entered the fray as the animation critic you see today, sometime after the glorified horse manure known as The Last Jedi entered theaters. And today, I shall address the latest pop culture debauchery to make its presence known. As this particular development is concerned with animation, I feel it is my duty to give my thoughts on it. As quite a few people in the fandom menace, particularly Clownfish TV, have discussed, Kevin Smith has been working with Netflix to create a continuation to the original He-Man series. I must confess, I am not well versed in the original He-Man show. Though the show has become a cult classic in its own right, I never quite liked the style of the original series. Don't get me wrong, the original He-Man animation isn't remotely close to being the worst style in the world, the awful Simpsons show is proof of that, but it is a hokey 80s style that doesn't match the level of a Don Booth film. In spite of my disinterest in the original show, I have nothing but respect for the multitudes of fans who grew up with and love the original 80s run of He-Man. After all, if it weren't for the original cartoon, we would not have He-Man at all. The He-Man I am more familiar with and actually love is the 2002 show of our favorite Conan the Barbarian ripoff. While I will not go into great detail, He-Man 2002 lasted for two seasons and its animation style was a notable improvement over the original show. I especially love the chemistry between Prince Adam and Tila as well as Tila and He-Man. Tila saw Adam as a coward, but also had respect for He-Man. If the show had continued, I imagined Hila would have eventually followed He-Man after a battle and watched from behind a bush as he changed into Prince Adam. This development likely would have caused Hila to view the seemingly cowardly prince in a much different light, one which would have led to romance and marriage. But alas, two seasons is all we got. But on the flip side, there are comics and other stories that reveal Hila and He-Man getting married. Anyway, I digress, but it was an important digression to show my level of knowledge as it applies to He-Man. The fact of the matter is, we all have been dreading the Kevin Smith version of He-Man, dubbed Masters of the Universe Revelation. Kevin Smith promised to respect the franchise while Clownfish TV was receiving insider information that he was planning to destroy He-Man and make it about Tila in all the worst woke ways possible. However, the time for debate is over. Now is the time to watch this show and judge for ourselves whether it is good or whether it is trash. Fortunately, a coworker of mine shares his Netflix account with me, or else this review from the animation commentator would not be possible. Netflix is a garbage corporation hellbent on destroying everything that is good and innocent in the name of money and, quote, tolerance. Anyway, without further ado, let's get into my thoughts of Masters of the Universe, Revelation. First off, I must say that I love the animation style. As I stated before, the world is currently overrun with crappy Adventure Time scribbles, hideous Rick and Morty caricatures, and even Star vs. the Forces of Evil abominations. I am so tired and fed up with all these animators with the talent of five-year-olds running rampant and shoving their hideous doodles in my face! Make me some new classics with beautiful animation! Now! Thankfully, that complaint emphatically does not apply to Kevin Smith's show. To his credit, Mr. Smith went out of his way to hire the same people who created the Netflix Castlevania show. I must say, I think I like the animation style of this show even better than Castlevania. Kevin Smith, thank you for hiring such talented artists. This is such a refreshing change of scene. You are doing your part to make classic animation great again with this decision. This praise of the animation style, however, is practically the only glowing review that this show deserves. I have my own formula as to what makes a good animated project. Is the art good, but the story bad? 
then the animated project itself is a failure and does not hold up. Disney famously followed this formula in the waning days of its hand animation enterprise. To this day, I have not watched Home on the Range, just to name an example. Is the art bad but the story good? Then this project too is a failure. I have received in the comments section over and over again that I am too hard on Star vs. the Forces of Evil and other such shows. Here's the thing. I don't care how good the story is in that scenario. If the art looks like someone puked up his lunch, I will not waste my time with it. You're slow for someone in the fast lane. And you're thin for someone who likes animation. I don't like animation. I love it. If I don't love it, I don't swallow. Is the art good and the story good? This metric applies to most classic Disney films prior to Walt's death, plus the Disney Renaissance, not to mention movies like The Swan Princess, The Iron Giant, and The Land Before Time. Of course, what happens when the art and story are universally agreed upon as bad? Well, then you have an ugly looking piece of crap with a terrible story. As far as this metric goes, Kevin Smith's Revelation Show falls under the first category. The art is good, but sadly, the story is bad. And not just any old bad, but the worst kind of bad these days. Revelation is woke. How bad is the story, you might ask? I'm glad you inquired. At this time, I shall give my thoughts and summaries on each of the five episodes on Netflix. I shall let you decide in the comments below if my conclusions are valid. Now, let us explore the wonders of Kevin Smith's woke masterpiece. Episode 1 is titled, The Power of Grey Skull. The opening narration montage admittedly pays beautiful homage to the original He-Man series. We then see Tila replacing her adopted father as Man-at-Arms. This seems to be a troubling sign indicating wokeness, but on the other hand, perhaps it can work. Tila is an experienced military captain after all. The bantering between Prince Adam and Tila during the beginning does feel like old times. I do like the chemistry between the two when they are first together in the show. While Tila is celebrating her replacement of Man at Arms, Skeletor sneaks his way into Grayskull and holds the Sorceress at bay. The way that he tricks the Sorceress is good villain development as opposed to earlier versions of the Skull-Faced Criminal. Meanwhile, everyone at Tila's party keeps calling her Man at Arms. I roll my eyes until they come right out of my helmet. Seriously, would it kill anyone in the show to call Tila the Woman at Arms? She's not a man after all. Tila's party is crashed when Adam has to go save Grayskull from Skeletor. He-Man's transformation as a Rainbow Man is nothing to write home about. I like Odette's swan transformation sequences better. The battle between good and evil is spectacular. He-Man's feats of strength are the best parts of the episode. As Tila goes down beneath Castle Grayskull to chase Skeletor, I admire the beauty surrounding her. Just as Skeletor ambushes and prepares to kill Tila, He-Man comes to the rescue. Evil Lin joins the fray, making it He-Man and Tila versus Skeletor and Evil Lin. Just as Skeletor seems to be on the verge of winning, a plant guardian appears and wraps Skeletor in vines. Mossman is pretty cool. Skeletor kills Mossman and cleverly allows He-Man to impale him. In the act of impaling Skeletor, He-Man unintentionally unlocks the Hall of Wisdom. Even while the Hall of Wisdom reveals its secrets, Skeletor monologues about his evil plans. He-Man could have used that monologue time to knock Skeletor away from the powerful orb within. But he didn't. Great. Just great. The superhero's most powerful weapon against a supervillain and you wasted it. This isn't He-Man. This is Kevin Smith in a He-Man skin suit. Skeletor damages the orb and begins to destroy the universe. He-Man stops the universe killing explosion with his sword. Tila finally sees that it was Prince Adam who was He-Man all along. Both Adam and Skeletor disappear along with the orb. Tila shows heartbreak when Adam is gone. Prince Adam's father the king banishes man at arms. And then Tila gets angry at everyone for lying to her about He-Man's identity, which I would say the truth was simply concealed from her. Not a lie. 
The truth was concealed to protect everyone in true superhero fashion, and Tila in this Kevin Smith version just couldn't see it. This, of course, is the part where the show descends into utter horse manure. Episode 2 is titled Poisoned Chalice. The episode starts off with two hooded figures going into a mysterious chamber while holding beeping devices. Apparently it's a smelly place, since they complain about the odors. The two characters find an arm brace in a pile of trash, but are confronted by some humanoid skunk. We don't get to see the fight, we just see the skunk creature get kicked out of the smelly shack. Great going, Kevin Smith! You couldn't even show us a proper fight! Just kick the skunk's butt without even showing us the smackdown. Turns out the skunk creature was Stinkor. The two characters take off their masks. One of the characters is Tila, who is now sporting a Captain Marvel butch haircut. Way to go, Kevin my boy! Why is it fashionable to take women who were established as beautiful for several decades and turn them into unattractive butch haircut feminazis? The other woman is Andra, and she is the literal embodiment of the black female tech genius that we see so often in pop culture now. In other words, Andra is Kevin's ripoff of Marvel's Black Iron Woman. As soon as Tila Wannabe and Andra the Science Woman return the arm brace to its rightful place, they get hired by an old woman. She wants them to retrieve a goblet from Skeletor's evil lair of Snake Mountain. The two woke wonders of the universe sneak into Snake Mountain and encounter a bunch of druids. In true Star Wars fashion, they knock out two of the druids and disguise themselves. At this point, it looks like Snake Mountain has been turned into Tron. The druids and the remainder of Skeletor's minions are worshipping an entity called the Motherboard, and a scene that is reminiscent of Ruber turning his barbarian followers into a mechanical army, Skeletor's minions make people drink a potion that turns them into digital mechanical freaks. Just another sign that what made Eternia magical is gone, and now the citizens of this world embrace technology. The goblet that is turning people into digital druids is the goblet Tila Wannabe and Andra the Science Woman for after. Tila Wannabe reveals herself and raises the ire of the teched up druids. The two bestest women ever are retrieve the goblet and trash the place. They give the woman the goblet, but now she wants them to accompany her on a journey to Greyskull. The two woke wonders agree to follow the old woman to Greyskull. They enter the castle and see the sorceress. She is now old. The other old woman reveals herself as Evil Lynn. The sorceress gives Evil Lynn the last bit of her power. Cringer, He-Man's cat, is still alive and remains in Greyskull to protect the frail sorceress. The woke wonders align themselves with Evil Lynn to bring magic back to the world. Episode 3 is titled, The Most Dangerous Man in Eternia. It's obvious by now that the show is trying to keep viewers invested in the story through the use of flashbacks involving He-Man at the height of his glory. They pulled the same stunt in Episode 2. Are you loving those member berries yet? Good. Me neither. Don't fall for the cheap member berries, people. They'll get you every time. The flashback ends, and we see our trinity of woman power chopping through a forest. The scene goes to a village where we see men-at-arms in a cloak. The teched up druids attack the village. Men-at-arms fights back. Just before Men-at-Arms gets killed by a laser cannon, the weapon is disabled by Audra the Science Woman. Tila Wannabe also jumps in to save her adopted father. To Kevin's credit, Men-at-Arms keeps fighting and isn't portrayed as a wuss at this part. In the end, the Trinity of Woman Power and Men-at-Arms get tied up in druid cables. Before the four characters can become assimilated into the motherboard, Beast Man shows up to save the day. After the rescue, Man-at-Arms finally becomes a simpering crybaby and begs Tila Wannabe to forgive him for hiding He-Man's secret identity. Oh please, Tila, I'm so sorry for following my prince's orders and keeping his secret identity safe. Oh, stop your sniveling, you Kevin Smith puppet! Anyway, we see Orko is sick. He's running out of magic like the Grey Skull Sorceress. Men at Arms refuses to go with the Trinity of Woman Power while Orko pleads to come along in his sickened state. In the end, Men at Arms changes his mind and volunteers. 
Tila Wannabe sends Men-at-Arms to Grayskull while his robot duplicate goes with her. In the next scene, our characters are sailing over the Crystal Sea, where they are attacked by Mermen. Just before the characters can be drowned by Merman himself, Men-at-Arms comes to the rescue. He defeats all the Mermen and tells Tila Wannabe that he's not leaving her. Under duress, Merman uses his ocean powers to take our characters to Subternia. Once they reach their destination, Men-at-Arms leaves the team to go to Grayskull. Even as the characters descend into Subternia, I descend into utter boredom and ask myself when Kevin's woke nonsense will end. Diversity and inclusion, am I right? Sniveling Men-at-Arms, anyone? And surely I'm not the only one tired of the new trend of taking beautiful women and giving them butch haircuts. And yet, Men-at-Arms was still a good and capable fighter. At least he has some shred of dignity left when compared to Jake Soywalker. Anyway, on to the next episode. Episode 4 is titled Land of the Dead. Right off the bat, the characters get separated in Subternia by illusions. Tila Wannabe confronts Skeletor. He waves half of He-Man's sword in front of her face. He tells her he will give it to her in exchange for her fear before sending her down a bottomless pit. Meanwhile, Orko sits at a dry fountain and shares his life story with Evil Lynn. They are then chased away by a giant gorilla demon with a horn. The scene goes back to Tila Wannabe. She is confronted by an evil He-Man. They start to duel. Meanwhile, Andra the Science Woman is with Man-at-Arms Robot Duplicate and Beast-Man. They are fighting off hordes of zombies. I'll admit, I do love the sequence of Man-at-Arms Robot fighting off these zombies. Even as he kills them, he's being so polite about it. Excuse me, I'm sorry, pardon me. That will require medical attention. This is probably my favorite scene between episodes 2 and 5. In the midst of the Kevin Smith wokeness trash, there's a little gem of wholesome humor. We flash on over to Orko and Evil Lynn. They are still being chased by the horned King Kong. Then we go back to Tila Wannabe fighting Evil He-Man. Evil He-Man taunts Tila Wannabe and reminds her that Adam never really trusted her. Evil He-Man then punches Tila Wannabe in the gut before shapeshifting into Tila. The Tila that we all know and love, not the butch cut Tila Wannabe. After a little monologue, Evil Tila turns into Skeletor. Tila Wannabe then tells Skeletor that she now has the power to control fear. She then materializes half of He-Man's sword in her hand and tells Skeletor that she is his worst nightmare. After this, the illusions disappear, and everyone is back together again, and Tila Wannabe holds half of He-Man's sword. The butch-cut lady then gives it to Evil Lin. Evil Lin uses it to open a portal through a stone doorway. The land on the other side of the door is the beautiful Preternia. Skeletor appears and traps everyone. The skull-faced villain then starts to bring down stalactites. Orko, ever the hilariously failed magician, steps up to the plate and stops the falling rocks. A wizard's duel ensues between Orko and Skeletor. The other characters free themselves while this goes on. Then, in a fiery explosion, Orko takes out both himself and Skeletor. The other characters go to Preternia and mourn over the seeming death of one Orko. At this point, Prince Adam appears on the scene. Episode 5 is titled, The Forge at the Forest of Forever. The episode begins with Prince Adam and his new gang mourning the passing of Orko. Adam gives up the half of He-Man's sword that he was still carrying. So the two halves of the sword are in Tila Wannabe's possession. <sighs> Great! It appears He-Man pulls a Jake Soywalker maneuver and throws away his special weapon. This is the last Jedi all over again. Tila Wannabe gives the sword halves to Man-at-Arms robot duplicate. She and Adam then walk in the forest. The prince reveals that he is looking for the man named Grayskull. Then we go back to the other characters, wherein Andra the Science Woman proposes turning a tower into a forge to put He-Man's sword together again. Adam and Tila race a couple of warriors who are riding on dinosaurs and weird evolution bird creatures. Grayskull himself appears on the back of a Triceratops. 
Okay, not land before time quality, but the dinosaurs are excellent. Grayskull explains to Tila a wannabe at a campfire that there is one way he can send them back to Eternia. Tila wannabe walks away from the fire. We go to the castle in Preternia and see that Man-at-Arms robot duplicate is preparing to put He-Man's sword together again. We go back to Tila wannabe as she is screaming at Adam for not telling her about his secret identity. Once again, I roll my eyes until they pop right out of my helmet. In what way did not knowing Prince Adam was He-Man ruin her life? He did what he did to protect his loved ones. If they don't know he is He-Man, they are less of a target for the villains. But I digress. Tila Wannabe leaves, and Adam is left alone with Moss Man. Moss Man pulls an old dog's go to heaven stunt and explains to him that if he goes back to Eternia, he may not be able to return to paradise. Prince Adam... You can never come back. You can never come back. Once again, we see the robot in the process of putting the sword together again. The robot succeeds, but at the cost of blowing himself apart. Tila Wannabe and Audra the Science Woman weep over the robot as he monologues about feeling fear and dies. In the end, Prince Adam rejoins Tila Wannabe and her friends and goes back to the realm of the living with them. They wind up at Castle Greyskull and meet Man-at-Arms, who fights off a bunch of teched-up druids. Cringer is happy to see Adam back. Tila Wannabe gives Adam the sword. Adam goes to the basement of the castle and begins his He-Man transformation. The teched-up druids see the transformation from a distance and run away. Just as I start to feel that the show is about to redeem itself and maybe, just maybe, pull away from its woke nonsense, Skeletor appears from nowhere and impales Adam before he can complete his transformation. In the ultimate subversion of expectation, Skeletor calls upon the power of Grayskull and becomes master of the universe. That is where the five-episode show ends. Is Kevin Smith's Ryan Johnson maneuver unexpected? After all the times this woke formula was used? No, it's not unexpected. Is it disappointing? Oh, most definitely. But most importantly, if anyone can wield the sword and call the power, why didn't someone snatch the sword from Skeletor and call the power? I was under the impression that the sword had to choose its wielder. Oh well, silly me for my uninformed naivety. But perhaps the worst part of this show is that Kevin Smith's hatred of He-Man really shines through. Not only did he go out of his way to kill He-Man, he hated him so much that he brought him back to life just to kill him again. Oh, Prince Adam, you deserved so much better than this. And that, dear viewers, is the end of the summary of the show. In short, the animation is refreshingly spectacular, but it is woke to the point of nausea. If my friend Rage on the Dragon weren't so busy at the moment, he would send this piece of Netflix bile into the burn zone and reduce its subversive abomination to ash. I believe I shall end this Masters of the Universe Revelation review here. If you like this video and wish to see more like it, please hit the thumbs up, share the video, and subscribe to this channel. Also, be sure to check out Clownfish TV. They stay on top of a lot of animation news in their own right, among other topics. Now my friends, go forth, be gracious to everyone, and may God bless you.